So Neil, in part one of this video, which you can point to, people can go watch. Somewhere uh, here. Yeah, you talked about yeah. the limitations of, um, that people may have in terms of getting aerodynamic on the bike. Three of them, so yes. people can go watch that. Today, I'm, and I've been hanging for this video because <laughs> I just ticked all those boxes in that video. Um, how do we resolve these problems? Okay, yeah, so some of these, resolution is a tricky word. You can improve a lot of this stuff. Now, the individual ability of, of these things to improve is determined by A, how much effort you're willing to put into it, and B, some immutable kind of genetic characteristics. So, you know, you may have some limited success with some of these things, you may have massive success depending upon what your body is capable of doing and how much change it's capable of, and also how much time you're willing to invest in these. So with that caveat out of the way, we'll deal with the three big ones. And the first one we spoke about in the previous video was anterior pelvic tilt. So being able to tilt your spine forward and maintain lumbar extension right which is essentially a, a kind of a, a fancy way of saying that you need good hip mobility right so what what you need to be able to do to, to operate in this position on a bike is you need to have a couple of things going on you need to have hamstrings which attach up on the back of the pelvis which have the ability to operate in a really lengthened position so as you roll your pelvis forward the hammies need to lengthen right they need to be able to generate force and stabilize and everything up in that position on the bike and you need to train their ability to operate in long, in what we call a long length tension relationship, which just means that the muscle is out at its end of range. It's almost on stretch, but it's still able to generate good power. So you need to be able to train that. So there's also other things. There is, there is extension ability of the, of the thoracolumbar fascia, so the big sheets of connective tissue down your back. And there is also hip mobility thrown in there, which is kind of mixed in here as well. Now, let's talk about the hamstrings first. To improve the ability of your hamstrings to lengthen and operate in long, low positions on the bike, there's a couple of easy things you can do, which, which are nonetheless like quite specific, but quite easy to do. My favorite is contract relax stretches. Now I, I got, there's lots of different names for these. PNF stretching is another one, but essentially doing what we call a, a static end of range extension stretch for the, for the muscle. So you would typically lie on your back with one leg up on the wall and the other leg out in front of you with your heel resting on the wall. Push with, so pull the muscle up into end of range so that your hamstring is on stretch and then push your heel into the wall for about 10 seconds at a time and then drop it down out of the position for another 10 seconds put it back up on the wall and put it into a bit more stretch and gradually work your way in closer to the wall. So I'll demonstrate these all for you so that it's in there, Ken. Um, so con contract, relax stretches, 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off, about 10 of them on each leg. And you'll notice that with each time you do it, your leg can go higher and higher up the wall. I like to then at the end of this, I like to hold it up there for about a minute, just to give yourself a long static stretch for the muscle and, and try and get the muscle spindles to lengthen out. Do this obviously on both legs. So contract, relax stretches are really, really good. Another good method of doing this is an end of range, I think the best description I would give this is an arabesque, an end of range, hamstring extension arabesque. So basically you're, you're holding a weight in front of you, standing on one leg and tilting your torso forward, maintaining that curvature in your lower back we spoke about and keeping your legs straight so that your hamstring has to control the movement at end of range. So the hamstring is lengthening out while it's under load. So this is an exercise you can do at the gym. You would typically use a, a small plate weight, like a five or 10 kilo plate weight or a dumbbell. I'm gonna demonstrate this with an eight kilo dumbbell. Repetitions of this in the gym, are, they're not designed to make your hamstring stronger. They're designed to make it operate in longer relationships. So, so in a stretch position better. So these single leg arabesques so I find are really, really good for this. They're also really good for teaching, um, for, for retraining symmetry issues. If one hamstring's a bit iffy, it's not working very well, this will tend to even things up as well. So contract, relax stretches against the wall, static hamstring stretches, single leg arabesques, sup supine ex end of range hamstring curl. So you can use a TheraBand, uh, you know, an extensible band for this one, lying on your back, hooking the band around your ankle and operating the hamstring Contra in a contractile sense, like contracting it at its end of range through the band with the band's resistance. So this is another way. All three of these are doing exactly the same thing. They're all aiming to lengthen the hamstrings so that you can rotate your pelvis forward better.
So that's one part of that kinetic chain puzzle is, is, is being able to operate your hamstrings in, in longer positions. Second piece of the puzzle is lengthening the thoracolumbar fascia. Now down your back, a bit of anatomy here, down your back there's a lot of sheets of connective tissue, lots of layers of them. And these are basically called fascial sheets. And these things need to be trained to, to lengthen, right? So you, you essentially need to stretch them. You need to roll them if possible with a foam roller. You need to potentially work on maybe some deep tissue massage if you're that way inclined, if you've got the ability to go and get some deep tissue massage, but essentially working on the fascia to lengthen it by with long, slow stretches of the fascia into extension. This is a really big thing. Um, I like to use a foam roller basically and hang over it rearwards and roll it up and down the spine. And then I like to work on prone, uh, prone extension stretches, which I'll demonstrate for you as well. So those, those two things, the hamstrings and the thoracolumbar fascia, really critical for being able to anteriorly rotate your pelvis whilst maintaining a thoracic, a, a lumbar lordosis, sorry. So work on those off the bike. I would say 20 or 30 minutes of that a couple of times a week and you will see some improvement in your ability to tilt your pelvis forward whilst maintaining that curvature in your back. Let's move on to hip impingement. So um, if you've got hip impingement issues, you need, to do, you need to do two things. You need to have the ability to get your knee up towards your chest really high, and you also need to improve your internal rotation range. Now, it's important to note that hip mobility is a function partly of sacroiliac joint mobility. So this is a bit of a deep dive, but the two joints in the back of the pelvis called the sacroiliac joints, they need to be able to rotate freely for all of this to happen at the hip joint. And um, we won't delve too deeply into the anatomy there, but um, if you've got really good hip mobility and really good sacroiliac joint mobility, you'll have a much better ability to operate in low positions on the bike. So what can you do if you've got restrictions here? Piriformis and deep gluteal stretches, what we call a four point stretch, pulling your knee up and across your body to stretch the back of the joint out. Um, they work quite well. I tend to like to hold these ligament stretches for, or, or deep muscle stretches for about 30 to 60 seconds at a time. So really long, slow holds. Hip flexor stretches, big one, because that will also stretch the sacroiliac joint into frontal rotation. Sacroiliac adductor squeezes. So I'll show you these where basically you lie on your back and you squeeze something between your knees to lever the sacroiliac joints open. I like to hold them for about 30 seconds and do about four or five of them in a row before doing the other stretches. All of this stuff will help with your hip mobility. And in particular, the one that I got you doing a lot of cam, which was internal hip rotation stretching, where you basically sit down on your leg and internally rotate your femur and try and hold it there and stretch it into that position. If you're major restriction is internal rotation of the hip, work on that one a lot. A really, really basic one is to just pull the knee right up towards your chest and hold it there in that deep position for long periods. Really, really easy thing to do. And this is, you know, this is what needs to happen in a bike in an aerodynamic position. Your hip needs to be able to get up onto your chest if possible. So working on stretches that pull the hip up into that range of motion will also work really well. At this point, if you've got major hip impingement issues, you might want to think about shortening the cranks and potentially widening the Q factor of the bike. So these are, these are on-bike things you can do, which we'll um, go through in the next, next video that we're doing, is how to know if you should need shorter cranks. Um, but consider if you're having major problems and you see on the footage of yourself that your knees are splaying out away from the bike and you really feel like your feet need to go further apart, consider moving your feet further apart using longer spindle pedals, wider spindle pedals, or running shorter cranks, right? So that'll also help. Now, number three on the list was the thoracic curvature that we spoke about. So the curvature of your upper back, the ability of your rib cage and your spinal segments in your upper back to extend and flatten out so that you can look down the road in a low position on the bike, right? You wanna work on spinal extension stretches here. This one's very straightforward. So leaning back over a foam roller, the two tennis balls in a sock stretch, which we've demonstrated in another video that we've done, long, slow holds in extension for up to a minute at a time, working on the ability of that section of your back to flatten and, and even extend. I like to use a foam roller for this. It's probably the single most effective thing apart from the tennis ball stretch. Um, and this will work really well. 
with your thoracic spine, it's, you must note that that curvature is also influenced by the ability of the spine to rotate and also laterally flex. So you will also want to stretch your spine into rotation and also into lateral flexion. So we'll, we'll demonstrate all of that for you and hold these stretches for 30 to 60 seconds at a time. These are all valuable. The more mobile your thoracic spine is, the better you'll be able to look down the road ahead of you and not hurt your neck when the bars go down and when you're in an aerodynamic low position position on the bike. It'll also help with breathing if you need another reason to do those. Um, the more mobile your rib cage is and your spine is, the deeper breaths you can take. Your lungs can potentially expand more and they can certainly expand more easily with less muscular effort the more free your rib cage is. So there's a lot of value in this. So those are the three biggies. Now you'll also need to work on your core. Anyone who's got rubbish core strength, they're not going to be able to hold low positions for long periods. Work on your core off the bike. 30 minutes twice a week is good. Planks, that kind of stuff, stabilization stuff for your back, it's all helpful. You must train the position. So once you've implemented this stuff, you need to go out and do some hard intervals, potentially your, your, your zone three, four, five stuff on flat roads if you're not doing it on the hills and actually hold deliberately long low positions with your pelvis rolled forward and your, air, your, your elbows drop down and your head low and you're looking down the road, train the position. Because if you don't train it on the bike, when it comes time to do it in a hard bunch ride or a race, you're not gonna know what to do, right? So you need to train this on the bike, work on all, this, all of the stuff that we always talk about, which is being light on your hands, stabilizing your core, extending your spine. This, this will all help to get you to the point where you can actually do it when it matters, which is when you're rolling to the front in a fast bunch ride and you're in the wind, or if you're in a race, or if you're off the front, yeah. So you'll notice that some, some people will, will experience major loss of power in low positions. This is a bit of a funny one, you, you, and this I think is actually surprisingly common. If you get into a really low position, a lot of the time the riders' iliac arteries across the front of their hips will actually fold and close enough that they experience a really big loss of power. This is one of the reasons why a lot of people, when they're in a super low position, can't generate a lot of power to the bike. They'll feel their quads burning up too heavily or something. I believe there's a good case for, what, for what's actually happening there is the iliac artery, which is, you may have heard of people having iliac artery endofibrosis, which is a fibrosis of the, of the iliac artery across the front of the joint. You don't necessarily have to have fibrosis, but when you're in a low position, the artery has to kink across the front of your joint. And some people genetically, the, the artery will kink when they get in a low position and they won't be able to generate good force there. So keep an eye out for that. If you're really struggling with quadricep burn, in particular through the front and the lateral part of your legs when you're in a low position, it may well be that that's what's happening. And that one, unfortunately, I don't have a great solution okay. for. <laughs> that, one, that one is mostly a genetic kind of immutable trait. It's to do with the pathway of the, of the vascular structures across the front of your hip. Okay, so let's just say you can do something about it and you can implement these stretches. Just a couple of practical questions to wrap up. You said hold the stretches for 60 to, sorry, 30 to 60 seconds. Yep. How many, uh, let's just say you're stretching both sides, how many times should you do it in one stretching session and how? Yeah. what's the frequency? Do you need to do it every day or three times a week to get any benefit? Like what would you recommend? All good questions. I, th I think with long, slow, steady stretches that run for 30 to 60 seconds, I think you probably wanna do between three and five on each leg, so take your time. And the, so the whole session should take between 30 and 60 minutes if you're doing five, six, seven of these, maybe even up to 10 of these different things that I've, that I've run you through here. So this thing should take you like 40 minutes, maybe an hour if you're, if you're doing it at yeah, time. So I like to put a podcast on and just listen to something while you're there and just relax because your, your mood and your, your, if you're amped up and hyped up from a long day at work, you're not going to be able to stretch as well due to the endocrine system changes that are happening with all of that. So you need to be relaxed when you're doing this. So listen to something relaxing if possible. But yeah, five to 10 of each one on each leg, I would recommend. And ideally two a week, maybe three if you've got time. Okay. So you're looking at like an investment here of between maybe one and a half out to three hours a week. But I like, to, like, this is stuff to do just before bed, you know, when you'd otherwise be sitting at your phone doom scrolling or something, you know, looking at stupid videos of Cam and Neil on, on YouTube. You <laughs> might as well be stretching, yeah. right? So do it in dead time, you yeah. know, if you, if you possibly can. And I think two to three a week is, is viable cool. for a lot of people, yeah. And I should put a note in here as well, yoga is fantastic. If you're a group-orientated person, you like doing things in groups with other people, 
join a yoga class. It's brilliant. Yo like people who do yoga are way more flexible in general than people that don't. Okay. Yeah, so yoga is very helpful for this. Good tip. No worries. Thank you very much.